everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. My name is Ellen Kawana. Um, my pronouns, pronouns are she, her. I'm the president of Northwest Science Writers this year. We'd like to start this event by acknowledging the ancestral territory of the native land on which we are living, learning, and working today. For those of us in Seattle, it's the unceded green spaces on the traditional land of the Coast Salish peoples. We offer land acknowledgement as the first step in expo of in the first, as the first step in opposing the systematic oppression and historic erasure of native people and native land ownership. Indigenous people are often talked about in the past tense, which makes it easier to dismiss their struggles. As science communicators, we understand that how we shape our perceptions of the world are influenced by language and therefore it's important the words that we choose. Through our actions and our words, we remind ourselves that we need to remedy land, social and other injustices through our beliefs, actions, and yes, our language as we steward our green spaces and communities where we live. Tonight, I'm honored um, to have David Mills here to moderate a talk with Chantal Pratt. He will do um, her introduction. Um, first, a little bit of business for Northwest Science Writers um, members. We have a few upcoming events. If you wanna um, mark your calendars and jot a little note to save the dates, I'll also drop them in the chat. Um, when we will confirm the dates, but right now we're planning a book, a book panel um, called So You Want to Write a Book with some of our members who have written books or are writing a book. Um, we're hoping to do that Tuesday, July 12th at 7 p.m. And then August 4th or August 5th, which is a Thursday or a Friday, we're going to have a book launch party for our Northwest Science Writer member, Madeline Ostrander, who has a book coming out on um, sense of home and climate change. And that's gonna be down in South Lake Union um, at the collective most likely. So that's um, August 4th or 5th and that will probably be 6.30 to 9 p.m. We also still need more mentors. If anybody wants to mentor an early career or somebody who has switched careers or a student in science communications, you can email info at northwestscience.org. I'll also drop that in the chat. And please be sure to opt into the directory if you want your information listed either to other members or to uh, the public facing part of the website. There are two different options for that. So just go update your profile within your membership. Um, thank you for muting. Um, Again, feel free to toggle in and on and off with whether you appear on camera or not. We are recording. Feel free to drop uh, questions in the chat and something that makes it easier to, easier to scroll through there and identify the questions as if you just proceed it with a capital Q and a colon. So I'm gonna turn it over to David Mills. Um, he was a board member last year. He's been active for many, many years and he is an expert in physics and science and theater. So take it away, David. He's also my neighbor. He's two houses down. <laughs> so Hi, Ellen. hello. <laughs> Thanks, Ellen. So Professor Chantel Pratt has a many faceted presence at the University of Washington with the departments of psychology, neuroscience, and linguistics, and affiliations with the Institute for Learning and Brain Sciences, the Center for Neural Technology, and the Institute of Neuroengineering. She's featured in the documentary film, I Am Human. Her studies are, have been profiled in media ranging from Scientific American and Psychology Today to Rolling Stone and Popular Mechanics, and of course, National Public Radio. I first met Chantel, I think in 2017, when I asked her to participate in Infinity Box Theater Project's thought experiments on the question of being human. That year, it was the science of changing your mind. I don't know what she and her playwright partner talked about, but the play was brilliant. She has, she's here tonight to talk about her new book, The Neuroscience of You, How Every Brain is Different and How to Understand Yours. Thanks for joining us both tonight and as a new ENSWA member, Chantel. Thank you, Welcome. I'm so happy. I mean, I, I have so much to learn about science writing, ironically. <laughs> the cart got ahead of the horse a little bit, but um, I, I'm very, very motivated to be surrounded by like-minded people who think science shouldn't live in the ivory tower and should belong to the people, so. So there you are. Well, that, that's my first question. <laughs> <laughs> your, your work has been, and I think the fascination of your work has been really focusing on how all of our brains are different in, in your, your academic research and in your teaching. So the question is, how did you get from there to, I have to write a book? 
Oh my gosh. It was, it's so wild when you just said the science of changing your mind, which of course was our topic was that was like changing minds is really what motivated me. And I think in 2018, 2019 political climate before the pandemic, I was so, I mean, like all of us, there was so much social anxiety and so much, um, I was just really disturbed by the the fact that people seemed unlikely to engage in political discourse or disagree with, you know, disagree in sort of productive ways. And my husband is, all, as you know, my husband, who also did Infinity Box Theaters, um, is also a neuroscientist. And just, I had this intuition as he and I were sitting around the table talking about politics and opinions and everything that my understanding of all of the levels of interpreting my brain does for me and how that's different in different brains might give me a lens that helps me be more open. I thought maybe if I help people understand the difference between their subjective experience of reality and the physical world out there and all of the levels from the color of a dress, black and blue or white and gold, to sort of your identity-based belief systems, all of the levels that your brain creates your sort of personal reality TV show, if I if I walk them through those steps, could I help that could I help motivate people to try and understand others and try and have more compassion for others? So it's really, really about changing minds. That was really my message. So or my motivation, I guess, motivation, really. Huh? Mm -hmm. So there, you're used to writing academically and you're used to communicating in, in the classroom and with your grad students in, at a different sort of academically. So the transition between that and, and talking to the rest of us about this stuff, uh, what, what was the biggest challenge? Oh my goodness. Yeah. Well, first, thankfully, when I started at the University of Washington, I taught intro psychology. So I taught you know, to 440, not all psych majors, you know, many, uh, you know, freshmen and sophomores, the kind of big picture ideas about psychology, you know, at this very thousand foot level. And I think that really, really helped with this kind of transition because I, I had a really clear goal about who I wanted my audience to be and how I wanted my book to be. And the goal was, I wanted my book to be for people like my hairstylist, Katie. I dedicated the book. She's one of the people I dedicated the book to. And I said, she's my muse because she's a very smart person. She knows so much about human psychology. I mean, she talks to people or listens to people all day as part of her, you know, side part of her profession. She's a very, you know, very intelligent person without much formal education who loves podcasts about science and is just fascinated by, you know, we would just geek out about all these different kinds of things about the brain and, and what have you. And I wanted my book to be for her, like someone exactly like her, who's passionately curious, but would maybe never pick up a book on the shelf about neuroscience. At the same time, I wanted my book to be more accurate than any of the neuroscience books I've ever read. Because mm -hmm. the very fact that the vast majority of neuroscience books on the shelf take the one size fits all approach. Brains work like this, memory works like this, language works like this. And, uh, you know, anecdotally, my husband's uh, graduate advisor said, good, good teaching is about good lying. Like it, that was his way of saying you have to simplify it. And that never sat well with me. So here I am, you know, my, my vision was to write a book for Katie, for people like Katie, normal, curious, passionate people that was technically more accurate than the other books I had read. And that was really hard. I mean, that was really hard. So biggest challenges. So on the one hand, I do think I have the ability, you know, I practice the ability in these big classroom environments of breaking things down. I spend, I'm really lucky. I spend most, besides the fact that I'm married to a scientist, I still spend most of my time with non people that aren't in academia. So I have these kinds of conversations with normal, I call them normal. I don't want to say academics are abnormal, but you know, 
I talk to normal people about science a lot. And so I kind of thought like, how would I explain this to Katie? Like, how would I, how would I talk to my mom about this or some other passionately curious person who doesn't have a PhD in neuroscience, but, but, you know, then, you know, shortly after I started this endeavor, the pandemic happened and all of these mega massive amounts of stress happened and I got behind on my deadline and I was like, you know, all the pressures and everything. And what I realized is um, under pressure, under time pressure, under survival pressure, I quickly would default back to this, not necessarily, um, like writing an academic paper, but more like writing a grant or something else equally like terrible to read. Like I would just start like listing the facts or trying to like prove a case or something. And I'm like, Ugh. you know, I'd ha I really had to catch myself. I threw, I mean, I threw away hundreds of pages, hundreds of pages. And I, I kind of let, I got to the point where I'd let myself write these pages, like on some at some point I was trying to talk about semantic and episodic memory. And that chapter became colloquially known as the George Washington chapter. Like I wrote, I don't know what happened, but I wrote like 30 pages about George Washington that, that had nothing to do with anything. And I was just like, nope, you're doing it again. Like, nope, this book is boring. Like this is not a grant. So it was hard. And, and I, and it, I certainly, I'm not even close to perfecting it. Like I just got done reading the audio version today. And that was the first time that I've sat and read through the book because it was such a time pressure. I mean, I, I edited and proofread, but reading through the book from beginning to end, I can still say like, why did I say it like that? Why did I write that five line sentence? Like, this is terrible. So I, I'm sure it's a, it's a work in progress, but it was really, um, I really just tapped into who I want to talk to. Who am I talking to? How would I explain these things? What do they need to know? I added a lot of footnotes, which may or may not be completely distracting, but kind of gave people options. Like, how deep do you want to go on this? Do you want to know why I'm giving you a range here? You know, mm -hmm. but it was very hard. Uh, yeah. So the, what you said about the audiobook. I guess that's another one of another one of my questions of well, what was that like hear, hear, hearing your book in your own voice, having not actually read it through out loud before. <laughs> I feel like this is an adventure in learning all of the ways I can be not good at things. <laughs> like, <laughs> like it's great. It's great to be out of your comfort zone and kind of growth mindset. And it was a it was a wonderful adventure, but really. And my, um, the person who directed the audiobook is a professional narrator and an actress. Um, and so getting kind of tips from her and everything was wonderful. But really, if I'm, if I'm privileged enough to be able to write another book, I will really think about how will, the, how will this sound too? How will this sound? How hard will this be to say? And let me tell you the, probably the, besides staying alive and energetic for nine hours, at a time for speaking, the really hardest thing I did was try and pronounce everyone's name correctly, and you know find the um, nationality. Try and find the nationality of you know if I could if they were living and I could find an email, ask them how to say their name, have them send me audio files, and then people like one of my good friends who um, I did my postdoc with is a Russian woman, and I was like Svetlana, like I think your last name is Shinkareva, Shinkareva, but I think when you say it, it sounds like Shinkareva or something. Can you send it to me? So she sent me an audio file and then I'm like, wow, now I have to try and do that. <laughs> you know, it's like, I know all the reasons that these, you know, these phonemes are not in my language. I can barely produce them, but I really wanted to try. So it would be in the studio. I'd be listen, like, you know, have a little clip, listen to it and then try and say it while it was echoing in my in my brain and Dutch names are so hard uh you know that was I think that was the hardest part is trying to honor the the culture and the and you know give someone credit and not murder their names mm -hmm. right. that was really challenging yes and that's especially because there's a lot of other people's work in your book it's it's not it's just about yours of course it's almost that that was another surprise I don't know if it was a surprise 
Because like I said, I had a very clear intention and that was just to walk people through some of the ways, some of the ways that brains differ. And in particular, fixing, you know, without bringing someone into the lab and recording their brain activation, how can I, what are the kinds of tests, what are the kinds of facets of brain functioning that I can actually give you a paper and pencil test and you can get some kind of inkling in. So really I learned so much and I would say five to 10% of the book is really my work or things that are my expertise. I would say 90% are things that are sort of things that I learned or things that I, you know, connected to try and build this storytelling of the brain narrative. You connected it, you connected it in your own way. Right. So you right. Provided the, the perspective. And I think something I did in terms of like humanizing the book, making it approachable, making it for Katie and making it for, you know, people, my, my, intended audience was that I did put a lot of personal things in there, a lot of anecdotes, a lot of, you know, this, this one time in my life, this happened, you know, like, for instance, talking about um, implicit biases and the way your brains create shortcuts based on your environment, the way your brains adapt. And what you see is really driven by what you expect to see based on your previous experiences. And I told, you know, how we went for 400 dog walks in a row in my neighborhood. And one day I saw a guy walking two goats and literally my, my, you know, I, you know, the way I explained it is dogs come in lots of different shapes and sizes and your brain just knows that even though that's a really complex visual problem, your brain is making strong assumptions that the thing on the end of the leash, whatever shape size it is, is a dog. So when I saw the goats, it took like a measurable amount of time for me to understand. It was just like, does not compute, does not compute. Like, that's a goat. Like, What's wrong so, with that dog? <laughs> a really weird dog. So, you know, little things like that. And um, I think it, I'm not sure. We'll see how it goes. Because at the time I thought, well, this makes it less intimidating and more relatable. But now it's very strange because people who have read my book, like, you know, the, the producer or whatever say, Oh, I really feel like I know you. And as I was going back through, I was like, wow, I kind of told, there's a quite a few little things in here. You know, I'm not the most uh, reserved human. So I was like, I wrote that. I wrote, for instance, <laughs> somebody who proofread my book reminded me that I put in a footnote. Um, we were talking about um, how when you relive a memory, it counts as a new memory. It also shapes your brain, right? Like whether you're retrieving something, imagining it, you know, projecting into the future, watching TV, every conscious experience changes and rewires your brain. And, and I said, you can probably intuit this because if you play back a memory, you might have some of the same feelings. You might experience the same feelings that you did at the time. And I don't know why I picked this. I completely forgot, but I picked one of my very embarrassing moments, which was that I once met Jeff Bezos was at a, one of the iLabs, one of the um, sort of events for our, our institute. And I literally walked into the middle of a conversation about rockets and went, my husband really loves his Kindle and just like walked through. I mean, it was just like crickets and it was so, I mean, I'm probably blushing right now because it was so dorky and it was really embarrassing. And I was like, why did I write that in my book? Now, somebody, somebody, the person who proofread my book was like, I was thinking about your Jeff Bezos story the other day. And I was like, I wrote that. Wow. That was anyway. Anyway, we'll see how that, <laughs> we'll see how that goes. The cat is out of the bag though. Yeah. Yeah. We'll learn a lot about Chantel's brain. Yeah, there was never any part where I tried to play cool, that's for sure. Well, that that invites the rest of us to do the same as we're reading it, I imagine. Hopefully. Yeah. Hopefully. Yeah. So um, speaking of your own part of the work, then is I, I had a, a question of what's what's a really exciting thing that that you've discovered in your work that's in the book? Hmm. And, and well, and and how will people be changed when they read it? Ah. Uh, hmm. How will people be changed? Well, 
Um, I think that the exciting thing might be different than how people will be changed. So I think one of the exciting things that we've discovered that we've discovered in our lab is how much you can tell about a person's learning style or learning capabilities from just eavesdropping on their brain when they aren't doing anything at all. So we can record five minutes of brain activation when someone closes their eyes and relaxes in the lab. And we can predict like 65 to 75% of the variability in how well they will learn a natural language or a programming language. Just, be, just look at listening to the frequencies at which their brain prefers to communicate. And I think this is really interesting. One of the things I really, I highlight is that this doesn't mean one brain is better or worse. It just means that in the single environment that we're training them in, some brains are better suited to learn. So now we're doing a lot of work to understand why. What's the information processing characteristic at that frequency that matches the sort of online learning environments that we're putting people in? And once we can hack that, or once we can understand that better, then we can put every brain in front of a, an environment that's better suited for them. So I like to think of it as a finding your lane, not winning a race kind of a aptitude test. But in this day and age, when people are, um, when you know, more than half of the universities have dropped standardized testing from their admissions, which incidentally, I wrote a um, pitch to Scientific American like four years ago, talking about how neuroscience might be a bias-free or a less biased way to test aptitude. And now, you know, it's, it's quite interesting because the, these tests are gone, but the other things that people are using to assess aptitude are, are not unbiased, like GPA, letters of recommendation, and so forth and so on. And so the, the interesting thing about the brain-based assessment is that the way we measure aptitude with paper and pencil relies a lot on what somebody already knows. You know, it's kind of a history is the best predictor of the future kind of approach. You know, um, things like vocabulary. Nobody's born with a big vocabulary, right? But having a big vocabulary predicts success in this very specific environment that we've created um, in our Western education system. And so it's kind of like, the rich get richer, right? The history is the best predictor of the future means that people who have had the, ex the experience, the opportunities to get lots and lots of rich experiences have an advantage on these tests. And, and I'm keenly aware of this because when my daughter was a junior in college, I had, I had been a single mom for the first 12 years of her life. I had just gotten a faculty job when she was getting ready to go to college and she was taking these kinds of standardized tests. I would have never thought to, I would have never thought or even had the kind of wealth mindset, I guess, to enroll her in one of these standardized testing schools. My mom suggested this and her standardized test scores went up, you know, like three or 400 points. And she got into Berkeley and all of these places. And it's like, her aptitude did not change when she took that $700 test. So people are freaked out by the idea of using a, your brain to measure how successful you will be in a particular environment, but it's not that you couldn't study for that test. If we know what the kinds of information processing or what the neural rhythms that support learning in a particular environment are, there are all kinds of neural feedback apps, like things you can do to teach your brain to get into that state. And, you know, it's not, just because your brain, a certain brain in a certain state learns well, does not mean that your brain is predetermined to do this. The brain changes every, with every experience, right? So I think that's the, I think that's the coolest thing that we talk about, kind of resting state brain connectivity and neural synchronization. Um, probably, I mean, how will it change people? I think people, I hope people will come to appreciate all of the different ways that a brain can build your reality. And one of the things that I, um, another sort of area of expertise, um, something that I've been studying my whole life, is something I did my dissertation on, is how the two hemispheres of the brain collaborate, laterality. So the first sort of hands-on um, diagnose your own brain chapter of my book is called Lopsided. 
And it, it talks about the sort of popular myths about how all brains work, like left-sided analytical brain, right-sided creative, <clears throat> or even things like the left hemisphere does language and the right hemisphere does visual spatial. It's not true in everybody. So my daughter is one of the like one to 3% of people who has things completely reversed. She's a lefty and her language is bigger on the right hemisphere. And, and within, you know, all people within typically developing human beings, there's a continuum on which our hemispheres are balanced or lopsided. And the more lopsided, the more different they are from one another, the more specialized the functions become. It's kind of like having a team with a, with a visual, you know, with a visual artist and a really strong verbal person, you know, these people are experts in one thing, but they're not very multifaceted versus having a brain, you know, sort of multi-purpose team players. There are costs and benefits to both of these things. So I give people some, um, some ways to figure out how lopsided their brains are. And also throughout the book, um, different ways to figure out if the if you are lopsided and the two hemispheres are giving you different pieces of information, which one wins? Which one's louder? Mm. Do you want to do it? I have it. Yeah. I have that's the game I have. That, that was my question. Next, can you give us? Can you yeah, I have, there are a bunch of things in the book, but I'll just show you a, a, an example. Let's see if my okay. Here's my share screen. So. Um, so make yes. sure viewers, you're looking at your screen right now. <laughs> so you should see, can you see my arrow too here? Yes. Okay. So you should, these are chimeric faces and you should put them, put yourself so that they are straight in front of you. In order for this to work the best, you want them to be, you want your focus to be as close to the, between the eyes or between the nose as possible. If you're looking at these off to the right or the left, you want to kind of drag it to the middle of your screen. And my question for you is, which face looks happier to you? Which you can chat in or you can think about or you can tell me if you want to. Now, you might be looking at this, you might be the analytical type and being like, I really think these, these are symmetrical faces, which is true. They are symmetrical faces, but still for some, for most, for many brain types, one will feel or look happier. Okay, so are you guys done? Oh, I said, yeah. I said right side. That's such a weird no, mistake. Top, I should have said, yeah. <laughs> said top. Okay, you think that the top face is better. How about you, David? Yeah, oh, I think so. so. The top one. Okay. So if you think the top face looks better, then your, wait, how about you guys handedness? I'm a righty. Right. Interesting. Okay. So my best guess based on only this test would be that you two are probably more balanced brained. So if we were going to put this in the lab, I would give you a whole bunch of them and see systematically what, what your patterns are. So what happens here is that the right side of the face, if it's lined up, goes to your left hemisphere, left hemisphere first. And the left side of the face goes to your right hemisphere first. So I think the bottom face is happier strongly like even though i've seen these tons of times like there's no way like i'm very lopsided and i the left face processing in my right hemisphere which is showing the left half of that face completely both halves of your both halves of your brain can detect faces but the right hemisphere in typically lopsided people tends to specialize both in face processing and in emotion processing. And so my, my, the left side of that face, which goes to my right hemisphere is just so much louder in signal than the right side of that face, which goes to my left hemisphere. And it's really cool that you both saw the reverse. It's very interesting, but this can tell you, this can, this can tell you important things, not only for understanding if you're a forest or a tree person or how you, whether you break problems into smaller bits or sort of look at the, the gestalt whole, 
but it can also tell you really important things. You know, if God forbid you were to have a brain injury or something like this, the, the unless they're going to do brain mapping, the vast majority of surgeons, medical doctors, I've worked with these people. I talk to them all the time. They assume that people are typically lateralized. They assume that you have language on the left and face processing on the right. And that, you know, this is going to be these areas you might expect linguistic deficits, this area you might expect attention deficits. And, and it's just not even in every textbook in the world will point to the left hemisphere and say language comprehension is here, speech is here. It's not only a very, 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 very specific part of the story based on group averages. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's probably, I think that um, the biggest, well, I don't know if this is the biggest take home message, but for people who read science and don't do science, don't do neuroscience, don't do human neuroscience, I think the biggest surprise might be that by and large, our, our paradigms treat differences between people as statistical noise. By and large, like 90, I would say judiciously 95% of the research takes not just a group of people, but a group of college undergraduates and puts them into a, you know, a scanning environment of whatever kind of tool you're using and has them do two different tasks. So if you're interested in color vision, you might have people look at something in black and white or color. If you're interested in language, you might have them read something in their native language or a second language. Or if you're interested in reading, you might have them read a passage that invites inferences and one that doesn't. And what they do is they take the average of those undergraduate brains in the two different conditions and they focus their theories on how the average brain varies across conditions, right? So, oh, if the right hemisphere is more, more active on average, when you have to make an inference than when you don't, the right hemisphere is involved in inference processing. But I've always argued that you, why is that more interesting than what, how different brains look when they're doing the same task? Why is that not equally important for our theories of how the brain gives rise to the mind, right? So I think that that, I think that many people will identify with, here's how people have told you brains work, but guess what? Like here are four different ways that brains solve that problem. And your brain lies on any, you know, part of this different axis space. So it strikes me that, that uh, as an important audience for this book is not just people who don't have PhDs in neuroscience, but people who do have PhDs in all those other things. Definitely. And possibly also neuroscience. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's it's scary. And I think, you know, I, I in the introduction of my book, I acknowledge that there's a good, I, I, I believe that there's a good reason that people haven't studied individual differences because it blow, the brain is so complex and individual differences blow up that complexity. And all of the, many of the things that were the, in, the individual differences that we're interested in are things that your participant walks off the street having. It's not something that you can ethically manipulate most of the time, right? And they've had that brain throughout their life and that brain has carried them through all kinds of interesting experiences. So teasing apart the why, your brain works like this, my brain works like this, why? You know, that is so messy and so complicated. And I, and I completely understand why we don't do that. Why not everybody does it anyway. But, but the sort of trickle down is, this is not just true of, of neuroscience. It's, it's particularly true of neuroscience, but it's by and large true of the social sciences. It's by and large true of psychology, right? Like memory works like this, you know, even like social groups work like this, you know, and, and, and education and learning works like this. And so I think that um, parents, teachers, educators, mentors, um, supervisors, I guess just people, I guess we know, I mean, you know, in your heart of hearts, people say things like, I'm not wired that way. You know, in your heart of hearts that there's something about your brain that's like a little different, a little quirky from someone else, you know, you know, your partner or your parents or people you spend a lot of time with, you have these 
this history of experiences that tells you like, whoa, you thought you remember it that way. How interesting. I remember something completely different, but we don't really understand why we don't really have the sort of access to the information that explains that to us. And certainly what I've done is a sliver of that. I mean, it's a big question. Mm, it's a start. Well, yeah. Ellen's been collecting questions. So oh, cool. do you want to feed us so questions, Ellen, or should we open it up to everybody and people can come on camera if they want and just ask their questions? What I think she, she might have stepped away. Uh, or she just turned off her camera. Maybe she stepped. Uh, let me look in the chat and see if I can find a question then. Uh, Extra yes. Oh, I can start asking answering questions oh, here. Yes, you, can, you have access to the chat. Just pull yeah. It out and... So one of the questions that Ellen asked was, um, "Oh, these are such great questions." Okay, number one, how hard was it to get a? Okay, how hard? How hard was it to find a publisher? And did you get any guidance from the university? Um, I did not get guidance from the university, and um. I think, I, I believe I got very, very lucky. So um, I, one of my former colleagues at, in psychology had this list. She, she won the MacArthur Genius Award and she had people approaching her to write a book. She's been doing um, research on gender identity and um, for, a long, for a very long time. And so she kind of pointed me at this list of questions to ask potential agents and um and I got a a pretty well-known agent that specializes in um nonfiction in scientists in sort of science writing nonfiction and um and from there well it had to work very hard to do that I was like here's my idea and and Margot Beth Fleming who's my agent she's at um Brockman was like well, this idea is medium good, like let's work through this. And so it was like many, many iterations of the idea. From there, um, they sort of sent out, we worked on a book proposal, they sent it out to 25 or so publishers. I went to, I was actually in New York for, a, um, for the Tribeca Film Festival, which is really cool and exciting. I actually took meetings with these people and um and i found my dream home at dutton so i think my experience was a lot of being in the right place in the right time getting like having somebody who was kind of in because she had really great science and me like hey i'm going to ask these same questions to these people and and kind of work on it i know other people who um it it what the pluses and minuses of that is that i sold a book that didn't exist I sold an idea for a book and that I understand a lot of people write a book and then try and sell the book. And I think that there's something good about selling the idea for the book because the publishers can see their idea in it. It's kind of like when you read a story and there's all this room for you to fill in the details and bring it to life. But when you see a movie that's kind of all done for you, I think that the sort of pitching process and having and selling the idea for a book without a book like I didn't have a single chapter written I had blurbs um so I think that helped me sell the book however after going in having these great meetings talking about the ideas of the book my book my original title for my book was wired weird and I had a very kind of more quirky idea for my book and all of my chapters were like connected, connected lived, but like all of my chapters were kind of wiring themed. And after they bought my book, you know, my editor was like, oh, so this book is going to be like how you love, how you this. And I was like, what? Like, no, I don't know. I don't know anything about how you love. So, you know, so after this had already happened and the kind of discussions about what the book would be took off again, and that was pretty stressful. Um, so yes, I, I don't think, I did not get help from UW. I think I was very, very lucky because I had an agent um, and, and they have really good content. They're in New York. They have, they, you know, have lunch with the different editors of these different places. And I think that really helped me. 
to find a publishing house? Which is a great question. Um, there was another question about editors. Q, Q, Q. Did I have an editor take a look at it for plain language? Yeah, that was that was from me because that's that's one of I I started at UW uh, writing for Eric Chudler for neuroscience for kids. Oh, so I like, love this language. website. Plain language is you know something that that is my area of specialty. I'm just so I'm just wondering if you had somebody to help you with that because you know as you get more trained in science, your writing sort of becomes more academic and just like you were saying at the beginning, it you sort of have to shift gears to write in a different way. Yes, I did. And uh, yes, I did have an editor. And so like she's, she writes, she does all nonfiction, but not all science books. So her, at the same time she was editing my book, she's editing a book from Ralph Macchio about being the karate kid, <laughs> which I think is so cool. I was like, oh my gee, am I wow. the karate? Yeah, it's like, oh my gosh. So yes. And so she would say, I don't get it. You know, she would just say like, I don't get it. Like I read all of this and I still don't know what this tells me about my brain or how this is going to change me. I'm sorry. Like, what's the point of this? You know? So yes, the answer is yes. And she went through. Um, so like, she would give me enough rope to hang myself. Like maybe I'd read a whole chapter and send it to her. And then she'd be like, uh, you know, try this again, subheadings, ask a question. Um, what, what am I supposed to take away from this? So, you know, we wound up with, and importantly, the book is kind of two parts. The first part is like, they all have tests, but it's kind of like, this is about brain engineering. These are about basic principles that brains can be, basic spaces that brains can be different in. And then the second part is about like, now let's take your brain out on the road. So things that brains do differently, like focus, um, navigate, which is about memory and decision-making and, and things like that. But even though it's about two parts, it had, it needs to have, well, it doesn't need to, but the kind of challenge was that I think contemporary nonfiction is expected to have a narrative arc. It's expected to be organized in a way that takes you through from beginning to end, not like here's chapter one, you know, not chapter one, chapter two, but that builds. And so that was really hard. And my editor really, really helped me with that. Like, how do you find alignment between these pieces? How do you build, you know, make sure that they're not um, existing in a vacuum? And absolutely, she didn't, they did very little line editing. So I think I was okay on style at the line level, but at the like, what's the point? I don't get it, you know, explain this again. It was great to have somebody who's does lots and lots of nonfiction, but not necessarily science, does lots of biographies and memoirs and things like that. Nice, yeah, that, that's fascinating. Yeah, so that's more a little bit developmental editing um, rather than worrying about clarity and style and punctuation, but more the the bigger, picture and then so she was so she's first and then I found that there was copy editing which was way more than I thought it would be like I thought copy editing would be like this is the wrong use of a semicolon or whatever but there was like tons of fact checking they went to every like every um reference and they're like this is doesn't exist this is not the right year um this is not grammatical. <laughs> okay, fine. I don't know what this word means here. Um, and that was intense. I mean, and that, I thought I was done, but, and I wasn't. <laughs> but like, so that happened much, much, much later. Like my editor was very, very high level. And I think, I think, you know, again, like I'm going to be completely honest because I just read my book out loud and I was like, holy crap, I'm, I got to get better at this. <laughs> like some of the, yeah, you know, I still have like, there are, I know this to be true because I read this book. There are legitimately entire paragraphs that are one sentence. And I'm like, I would kill my students if they did this. How did I let myself do this? You know, and when you have to read it out loud, it's like, okay, well, I have now paid my penance, my penance. And next time, you know, I will be, I don't think I, I feel like it was, I was, I asked for a five month extension. I mean, like wow. started writing the book pandemic, 
entire lab shifts focus, lots of like family health, you know, just keeping the students' mental well being and everything afloat. So it was like, I had a five month extension. And that was, you know, my agent was like, eh, you know, this is a big ask. Don't F up. Like you turn it in on time. Right. So um, I would say, the majority of the energy went into storytelling, big picture. What do I want to say? What do I want to leave out? And, and I hope, like I said, if I get the privilege to do it again, it will be a little more polished with a little, with shorter sentences and, and, and better writing. I mean, the writing I think is okay. I think, um, what people like is my voice. It sounds like I'm talking I think um, it doesn't sound, I don't think it sounds academic. I think I talk about Beyonce and how, no matter how much you think it would be great to be Beyonce, it wouldn't be as great as you think because she's Beyonce every day. So her brain expects her, you know, to sing exactly like Beyonce. And if she has an off day, it's terrible. I mean, I put it in a lot of anything from like Game of Thrones to Beyonce to just the things that I think about, you know, um, it's not going to win any awards for the writing. That's for damn sure. Like the, I need, I, it's, it's a skill that I have not been trained in. I, I am not, I don't think I took a single writing class in college. I don't think I did. And that's why I'm like so excited to be part of this group because I'm sure that most, if not all of you write better than I do. And I can't wait to read your stuff and like get better on the, like, and the technical parts, you know, cause Certainly that yeah. that's one of, it's not easy. <laughs> well, yeah. And, and you do have an appreciative audience for that. And, you know, there are lots of tips and tricks. If you, if you do end up writing another book, you know, let us know. Um, you mentioned navigation. If I may ask a quick question, um, are there ways, did you learn anything in your research of, of exploring that topic? If, for example, I have no sense of direction, I'm horrible at navigation. Are there and now I would depend on our, my phone, like everybody else. So I worry, yeah. you know, my hippocampus is probably getting smaller instead of bigger or fewer connections instead of more that's Are so, there things we can do to improve our sense of navigation. Uh, that's so cool. Um, no. Okay. So in my book, navigate is really about memory. And the only time I really talk about navigation is the hippocampus. So I talk about the famous Lon London ca cab drivers and their big hippocampi and how they got that way and a bunch of like digging into that. But it's interesting because your hippocampus also has a map of your semantic memory. So we now know that like, so here's how I think it works. The hippocampus, you know, I think all vertebrates have a hippocampus and they all, and many of them navigate, right? And this creates a system where you, you sort of take your body around the world. Navigation is at the end of the day, you noticing how the things around you change, right? Like you walk here and you're like, the tree's on my left and the fence is on my right. And then you come back and you're like, the tree's on my right and the fence is on my left. And then you go here and you're like, the tree is behind me. And eventually if you can navigate, there's, there are different ways people navigate incidentally. Like some just go like two rights and a left and some can remove yourself from that, you know, those experiences. And then you create this mental map that doesn't have you in it, in it anymore. But whether or not you can navigate space or not, your hippocampus is still doing that with your memories. Like to take us back to the infamous example of George Washington, right? Like you probably don't, you probably don't remember, you have removed yourself from whatever the experience when you first learned about George Washington is. Like that started as a kind of navigation, as a kind of fact finding, you were in it. The, the memories that we have left that have us in them our episodic memories, first kiss or my last birthday party or something like that. Those memories still have you in them. But when you walk by a fact so many times that you can take yourself out of it, you don't remember any of this, any of the specific events. I can't speak anymore. I've been pronouncing words like specific and statistics for literally 30 hours. It's the worst. My, my brain can no longer control my mouth. It's just, it's gone. Anyway, navigate was this kind of like, knowledge maps in the brain and what we've learned about like um the code of how like your knowledge about celery or friend or like airplane like how these things become aligned in respect to yourself and your experiences with objects and 
people and all of this stuff. It really wasn't about the, the actual navigation was just a metaphor I used to figure out how people come to find things and use knowledge to guide their their future decisions. But I do know some, I mean, that I actually, that was a piece that I did not include because there are some strong, even rats, for instance, well, like the rats in psychology experiments that learn to navigate a maze, about half of the rats by default will learn to navigate the maze like two rights and a left to the food. There's something, it's called something. It might be, that might be called egocentric navigation. Like, you know, from your own point of view. So if you put that rat into the other side of the maze, they're hosed because they don't, they just make two rights and a left and they wind up, wind up in the wrong place. Where other rats will sort of build this, they look for landmarks, they look for things around them and get an understanding of the space. Those rats can navigate, for, it takes them longer, but they can, it's model-based learning or something, but they can navigate from different places in the maze. So that it, I think it's so fascinating that rats, you know, rats are really smart by the way. So that's maybe not a great example, but you know, rats have different ways of navigating. Humans have different ways of navigating. If you already stink at navigating and you're using Google Maps, yeah, it's, it's, it's not gonna get better. I try to like, honestly, like if I can, it's funny that you said that because it kind of validates this thing that I do sometimes where I'm like, we just moved. Well, by just, I mean, five months ago, but I'll try and go just to the grocery store or something without the maps and be like, it's okay. Like how lost can I get? Or if I get lost, I can pull up the map because then I, I notice things that you wouldn't notice if you're just, you know, like, oh my gosh, like I passed this gas station 45 times. Am I lost? No, I'm just usually looking at my phone to make sure it's 0.2 miles to my next left. So I do try to practice, but your hippocampus isn't shrunk. It's got a lot of other jobs. Yeah. And I, I guess it's doing something in a sort of a, a mindful, deliberate way versus just much more passive where you're, it's not a survival skill. So therefore you don't remember it and you don't process it in the same way. Yes. So, yeah. Very interesting. Um, we've got a few minutes left. Um, so if anybody else yeah. has questions, I mean, I, I'm, I have a neuroscience background, oh. so I had questions. But. Mm -hmm. This is so cool. I'm looking now at everyone's, uh, more than one person said right side, uh, but top, bottom, that's fun. Okay. I think as a group, we've got three tops and two bottoms at least. So we're, we're fairly equally split on the faces, which is kind of cool. And I think we're all, are we all right-handed? I think we are. So this is another thing that you probably, I think this was on Eric's website. He has the like hit the dots game when you can do it with your right or left hand. Like most people, handedness is a continuum. And so if your right hand is like halfway decent, you're going to identify as right-handed because the world is set up for right-handed people, right? Like using scissors or, you know, like everything is designed, you know, the desk is over here. So if you're even close to equal, even if your left hand is like 5% better than your right, most people will like shift and practice and get better with their right. But handedness is a continuum and there are all different kinds of ways you can, you can test the actual acuity of your hands. Here's a fun thing that I, I learned when I was writing the book. If you take right-handed people and you test um, like the, I don't remember what they were doing, but it might be like a box checking experiment or something like that of their left and right hands, just before you go to sleep, and just after you wake up, your left hand becomes dominant. So the left hemisphere gets sleepy a little bit before the right hemisphere gets sleepy. And I think this is so cool because it's like, oh, there's this minute. <clears throat> if you feel like a different person in the morning and at night, there's this like momentary space where probably your dominant hemisphere, the one that's sort of interpreting and talking to you about the things that are going on, it, it, it shuts down before the other one does. And I was like, that is so cool. Fun fact. That is a fun fact. I love that. And I was going to say, when you said how the world is set up for right-handedness, I mindfully, when my kids were like in the high chair, or even before that, I would put the food in the exact middle of the tray and the drink in the exact middle of the tray, instead of like putting yeah. it on their right. And so I was hoping to not influence them and they both ended up right-handed. <laughs> so, so the coolest thing. So my daughter was 17 months old when I got my first job in a neuroscience lab. And she was just had this really good temperament so I could practice on her and we were putting EEG caps on her. And this was my first like remarkable brain. And so 
I, you know, we, we ran her an experiment. I was really just practicing and she was listening to words that she knew and didn't know. And I learned how to analyze the data and her, the differences between words she knew and didn't know were bigger over the right hemisphere. And my, my boss at the time said, is there any way that she's left-handed? And usually it's around between 20 months and two years before kids will stably, you can detect it earlier and it kind of depends on what you're doing. But I didn't know, like her brain told me she was left-handed before I noticed that she was left-handed, which was really cool because at, from that point on, I didn't do anything different, but I was like, oh yeah, she does like always use her left hand. And she does some other things that are really interesting, but always make me wonder if that's because her brain is reversed. Like if she's sucked into a TV show and not really paying attention, like completely like captivated, she turns her head like this so that the TV is coming into her right visual field and going to her left hemisphere. Mm. And I, she just goes like, like a little bit like this always. And I'm just like, so, uh, you know, I've, I've scanned her, you know, she's, she's got stuff going on in both hemispheres, but it's much stronger in the, in the contralateral lateral hemisphere to what you expect. Oh, that's super Which interesting. Fun. It's really interesting that you, you noticed Notice. that. That's, yeah. yeah, that's very cool. Um, but, but, but as you probably know, it's, What's not cool is that one in 10 people identify as left-handed and we don't know anything about their brains. Like we, this is a great example of where, how we're hold, getting held back by leaving differences out of neuroscience because the justific myself and others, I just grew up and inherited this view. Like you only scan right-handed people. And the reason for that is that left-handed people are more variable. Oh. Like, well, sh well, one in 10 people are left-handed. They also have strokes and pay taxes and get, you know, get educated. And that's pretty disturbing. Like, you know, that we don't have good models. We don't have good models. We don't, there are very few studies that actually look specifically at handedness and how it changes functionality of the brain. Very few. Wow. That's really interesting. Yeah. Do you have any more questions, David or Mara? Anybody, Catherine? Don't think so. So, well, I have lots of questions, but <laughs> we're for coffee later. <laughs> yeah, I want to hear more. What I want, I'm, I'll be looking at for my emails and like, I want to hear more about the group and what kinds of things you're all doing. I'm really fascinated by the different paths. I, so I also, among other things, have these three br brilliant graduate students who probably won't go into academia or try, are trying to figure out like what they want to be when they grow up. And, and I'm just really interested in how the different paths by which people come to be science writers because well, they, they should join us and we have a we have a mentor program um or we could you know figure out a time to do just open it up to anybody who are members and and do a zoom chat with them and sort of ask me anything or that would be whatever. great and speaking of diversity. mentors yeah speaking of mentors i thought like i would love to do that but i don't know if i'm good at it yet so maybe I better, <laughs> I don't know if I'm ready to mentor someone since I'm just sort of really starting, but maybe when I get good at it or get some formal training, I would love yeah, to. Yeah, or even, even sort of an accountability partner for if you want to um, accomplish, you know, one thing, like you're going to write a pitch for another book and then, you know, I'm going to, we're going to check in with your partner in a month and they have a goal and, and you just help that'd be awesome. stay accountable oh gosh, and give each other so feedback. Awesome. Um, so, okay. We do need to wrap up, but, um, okay. David, last thoughts or. Yeah. Well, I was just going to ask what's your second book going to be about. Oh my goodness. Uh, I have this idea. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, the right now the my inkling is that the book will be called animal and it'll be about the dark and light sides of control. So I think that we, we, we always think that like more control, more attention is good, but I think it's more nuanced than that. In the book, I talk about the horse and rider. And I think that like, we're so focused, we're, we spend so much time in this control state that people don't know if they're hungry or thirsty anymore, or if they're tired or just choking under pressure and things like that, that happen when you use a controlled process to over steer something that you're automatic your sort of procedural memory should be doing like mm -hmm. in the middle of reading my book, if I start to think about what my vowels sound like, like I can no longer say things, you know? Mm -hmm. So I don't know. I have no idea. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I deal with when, the next book will be around. When is this book out? What's August 2nd. 
Oh, I'll show you. I have the. I have the. Um, I have the yes. sort of. There it is. Sort of a galley-ish kind of a thing. I'll be a second, and um, I will be doing a, a Q and A at Elliott Bay on August third at seven p.m. If anyone wants oh, to come, yeah. come and hang out, that would be awesome. Excellent. Yeah, make sure we have that info because we'll put that in our newsletter and and post it on social media and things like great. that. Great, yeah. great. I'm excited to uh, spend more time with you guys. Yeah, that'll be fun. Well, thank, thank you, you so much for spending this time with us and saying all these fascinating things. You're welcome. A lot, a lot to thanks think for, about. Thanks for playing brain games with me. Oh yeah, anytime. <laughs> all right, I'll see you guys later. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.